got to thinking about Fourth of July this week, and um, as we were working on stuff for the bulletin, Destiny came and showed me the design that she so well does for that, and I uh, told her to make an edit in it, and um, you may or may not see the edit. Um, you may have, but in light of especially people now um, beginning to run for our presidential position next year, and just how so oft we are just to throw out the words, God bless America, I got to thinking, you know, it's time for America to bless God. And so in your bulletins, you'll see that turned around. Um, thank you for all of those who are veterans who are among us again as we remember the 4th of July, the independence, the freedom that God has given us. We do not take that for granted. But we are thankful even more for the freedom that Christ has given us in him and the freedom that we have of being kingdom citizens and uh, um, so equally, or even probably more so kingdom than patriot or country, but we ought not to take either of those for granted, working on our citizenship in both worlds, as God has given us to be citizens here, as well as learn to be citizens in his kingdom. There are two predominant worldviews that exist in the world, two ways of seeing things. I think I've probably shared this before. Here in the United States, we have an innocent versus guilty worldview. It's either right or wrong. You're either innocent or guilty. Um, I think more and more you're guilty until proven innocent. But either way, that's kind of how we see things here. It's in, in that vein of, of things. And there are several countries that see things that way. There's another worldview that is, we call it honor and shame. And it's not necessarily it's right or wrong, it's what brings honor, what gives me honor, what preserves honor in this situation. And it's just a whole different way of looking at it because it's right or wrong doesn't dictate what I do, honor dictates what I do. And preserving honor dictates that, not bringing shame to myself or my family um, or in biblical sense to the Lord. The, the Bible is cast and we read it we should read it out of an honor-shame worldview, not out of right and wrong. And if you were to start looking at it this way, you'll see some subtle differences in things, especially in today's passage, Matthew chapter 15, verses 3 through 9. We're going to see what Jesus has to say about the fifth commandment. But it's, it's his, his quote is cast in this light of honor and shame. So as you turn there, why don't you look at it with me? I'm going to read the whole passage and then um, we're going to focus in on specifically verse 4, but to see it in the light of the context in which Jesus shares it. Matthew chapter 15, and I'm going to start with verse 3. At this point, the, the Pharisees have come to Jesus, and uh, it says they came up from Jerusalem. A lot of times when Jesus is up in Galilee, they would send people from Jerusalem up there because Jesus didn't go down to Jerusalem unless he really, really had to. And so they would send people up to, to, or in our sense, up to Galilee, and in their sense, down to Galilee, because everything comes down from Jerusalem. They'd send them down there to, to just kind of spy and see how things are going. Well, in this case, they sent them to ask him a question. They said in verse 2, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. So Jesus replies, verse 3, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Very quickly, it's kind of what's going on here is the Pharisees are accusing Jesus of something really nitpicky, just trying to find something. You know, why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat? I ask my kids that all the time. But it's, it's not so much in a defilement. But y'all remember that the Pharisees had, you know, there is in the book of the law, 
a, a statute that says, you know, wash your hands before you eat. But it's not part of the Ten Commandments. And the Pharisees had gone on then to write this whole other law to add to these things of how you remain holy and all these kinds of things. And so they come nitpicky here. And so Jesus asked them, not so much that what the Pharisees are asking is wrong necessarily, but because health-wise you probably should, but also changing the subject a little bit to something a little more significant than just the nitpickiness of washing your hands. And so he addresses them, you want to talk about tradition, let's talk about this tradition. The tradition that you have that in order not to have to take care of your elderly parents, you choose to set aside part of your, that possession that you would use to have taken care of them and say, give that to the Lord so that you, then you can come to your parents and say, well, mom and dad, I'm sorry, I, I realize you have need of this. I would have taken care of you except for the fact that that part of, you know, I, I don't have the funds to do that. What they were getting this from is in Leviticus 27, it says, if a man dedicates to the Lord part of the land that is his possession, then the valuation shall be in proportion to its seed. Homer barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. He's saying that God accepted offerings of property. He accepted offerings of things that were not necessarily money. He allowed people to come and bring these things to the Lord. We see the practice of this somewhat in Acts chapter 6, 5. Acts chapter 5, whenever... Uh, um, so Ananias and Sapphira get in trouble for lying about it and bringing their, their stuff to the Lord. It's somewhat along this, although they were living in a new covenant and stuff. But, but again, um, God allowed for this. But what the Pharisees were doing was, is, listen, I really don't want to take care of my aging parents. You know, they want to come loafing off of me. I have worked hard for what I'm doing now. And so, Mom and Dad, I'm sorry. I have claimed Corbin. And I said, this portion here that I would have given you yeah, I gave it to the Lord. It's to be like my dad is, um, I think I've shared again, my dad is, he'll be 73 this year. And if he lives as long as his family here lately has been living, he'll live another 20 years. So I have no expectancy to have any kind of inheritance when he gets done. But if so, he could easily say, the, to, to the part of, of his possessions that may be my inheritance, say, well, I'm just going to give these to the Lord. Sorry, David, you can't have, you know, your inheritance is gone. I, I gave it to the Lord. You know, you just, you just have to do what, what you have to do. Well, the Pharisees were doing this to their parents, to their aging parents. Again, there is no Social Security. There is no retirement 401Ks. It's your family helps you to survive when you can no longer work. And so they were dishonoring their parents in doing this. And so what Jesus is referring to here in Matthew 15, 4 is this fifth commandment. Well, what does it say? When well, Exodus 20, 12, it says this, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which your Lord your God gives you. Jesus also goes on to add to this, Exodus 21, 17, he says, He who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Merriam-Webster and uh, also the Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology mention the word honor as a showing of respect. It is to give weight to someone to place another above yourself. See, honor is an internal attitude. It's when you come up to somebody and with a, you assume an attitude of courtesy, of respect, of admiration, maybe even reverence, but these should be manifested then in an outward expression of appropriate attention to the extent of obedience. And so my obedience should show my honor to whoever it is that I'm honoring, not just lip service or, or not just an inward thing, but it, it begins to show outward. Without the outward expression, here we go again, you know, to what Isaiah, seven, with, Isaiah was saying, without the outward expression, it's just lip service. I can say I honor you all I want to, but if I'm not outwardly showing that, then that's just, just kind of paying lip service to it. And it really doesn't go to the heart of, of, of the matter. Now, God is the source of honor. We have to, we, we realize this. He is the supreme creator and giver of life, and he is unsurpassed in this. We, we see that God has, is, is above all and all, and the first two commandments, again, reflect this. God stands alone. 
we hold him in this place of high respect, high honor, if you want to use the word fear as it's used, of, of trembling honor, trembling respect. If I come and I realize that, that God is the ultimate creator of the universe, someone who, who cannot be put in a box, he's unsurpassed. Incredible enough, though, that he has decided to bestow honor then on, on Jesus. He says, Jesus comes up and says, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, why does God allow this? Because Jesus is God. Simple enough. We see again in Isaiah, going back to what we quoted last week, is that, uh, or maybe a couple weeks before, and, and uh, the images and stuff, Isaiah says that, listen, I don't share my glory with anyone. I don't share my praises with anyone else. But all of a sudden, we see God sharing his honor with this, and with, with Jesus, because Jesus is God. But it goes even, even a little bit further, that God, he doesn't share his honor, but he shows honor to us in creating us just a little less than the angels. Psalm 8 says, what is man that you are mindful of us? What is man that you have created us just a little less than the angels? You, you, have, you have shown honor to us in this. Granting honor should be part of the Christian experience. We grant honor to our civil authorities. Romans 13 tells us we need to honor and respect those who are in elected positions. You don't have to agree with them. You don't even have to like them. But you better honor them. And sometimes we don't do that well enough. We need to pray for them. We need to honor them. We need to honor uh, who they are and the fact that God has allowed them to be in these positions. And Yes, we can vote against them, we can, we can, we can stand up and, and debate with them, but we will honor them. Our masters and bosses, 1 Timothy 6.1, mentions to the slaves, you are to honor your master, and in relevance to us, this is be our bosses. Those who are in supervisorial position over you at work, honor them. How do you do that? By obeying them, by doing what they ask you to do. Again, Inasmuch as that does not conflict with Scripture, then we do that. I saw a key illustration of this this week. Many of you are supervisors and bosses and corporate owners, and um, so you, you see this happening. But I got to see it uh, this week. I was chatting with some of our, our men who were out here uh, grilling and stuff, and uh, one of them happened to have some of the people who worked with him and it was really, really cool to see the honor that these men gave to our church member who was their boss. Phenomenal honor. Um, and it speaks highly of, of the person. Because they, you could tell just by the way they, they acted with him and the way they carried on with him, uh, just a deep level of respect and honor there. Um, phenomenal. Hopefully you do that to your bosses as well. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.3 tells us to honor our widows and, and to care for them. Our deacons do a really good job of, of maintaining task on all this and, and every, uh, just regularly visiting and, and caring for them. Uh, as well as we shouldn't just delegate it to them, we should do it as well, but our church takes this seriously. Romans 12, we should honor our fellow believers. You know, we are all fallen people. We're fallen individuals. We don't always see things eye to eye. Um, I don't see things eye to eye with most of you. Uh, you're a little bit less. You kind of see chest to eye, but that's you know, neither here nor there. Um, but we all have different personalities and different ways of, of going about things, but we should learn to honor and respect each other, to, to work it out. Because by and large, at the end of the day, most conflicts that we get into are really just misunderstandings. That if we would just communicate a little bit, have a little bit of patience, they tend to work themselves out a little bit. Finally, getting to the point here, we should honor our parents. Ephesians 6, 1, 2, and 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment, with promise that your days may be long upon the earth. Honor your father and mother. So as a side note, as we get into this, the looking at this, when we look at honoring your father and your mother, as parents, we should not take the honor given to us for granted, even if it is, we'll see in a minute, the lowest level of honor just because of our position. 
We should seek to gain it through character. We should seek to gain it through the service that we give to our kids. Um, because there is really a circumstance where dishonor is a mark of true discipleship. In 2 Corinthians 6, 8, they are told that dishonor is when we are found dishonorable by ungodly people because of our commitment to the Lord. And so ungodly people might find us dishonorable because of our stances on certain topics in following the Lord. But honor father and mother. I was looking at Maxwell's um, levels of, of, of leadership, and I saw these that these really mirror our honor that we give to our father and mother. So first, honoring might come because of their position. We honor them because they're mom and dad. And that may be the only reason why you honor them. Um, because of that. Uh, maybe you have a father and mother who are not godly. Maybe you have a father and mother who really don't, haven't done things to cause you to want to honor them. But if nothing else, we honor them because of position. This might be also you put there on this level, honor them because the Bible's told me so. And that's about the only reason. But hopefully you can go beyond that to honor them because of merit, because they, you see them on a daily basis, on a constant basis, doing things in your life that cause you to want to honor them, that cause you to want to serve them. This is honoring them because of merit. You might honor them because of experience, because you see that they have been through it. This is a, usually this doesn't happen or you don't come to this realization until you're kind of getting out of college and you realize I don't know it all, and actually my parents probably knew what they were talking about. But sometime in the teen years, you, you kind of lose this aspect of thinking, well, I'm a teenager now. I know everything there is to know. My parents are way out irrelevant. Their vocabulary is of a decade ago. It's a dad that was so yesterday. And we, we kind of become irrelevant for about 10 years. And finally, they, they wake up and realize, you know, they do have experience. They do know what they're talking about. They have been there. They have fought it. They have toiled with it. Maybe I should pay more attention to them. So we begin to honor them because of their experience. Ultimately, we should honor them because of the godly wisdom to do so. Because not only does the Bible tell me so, but if I want to be wise, I will realize that honoring my parents is a wise thing to do. If for no other reason. I may not understand everything that's something they've been through. I may not have known their background or how they got to where they are or this and stuff. But I do it just because I begin to realize this is the wise thing to do. See, God doesn't tell us to do stuff just to have a list of to do. He, is always, he always has a very wise reason for telling us what we should do and why we should do it. So what does honor look like? Well, it's obedience. Again, it's, it's respect. It's service. It's gratitude. It's being thankful for what my parents give or do for me. It's reciprocating the love that they gave to me. Praise and encouragement. It means I live my life in such a way that when people hear the name of Alexander, my parents are praised for it. When they realize that I am the son of Alan and Rebecca Alexander. That I live my life in such a way that brings honor to them. That's what honoring is. It doesn't, it doesn't, regardless of what they may have done, I live my life in such a way to establish that the name Alexander is a name of honor. It's a name that, sh that is, is lifted up and is a name that demonstrates integrity and respect and fellowship with the Lord. And that my parents are praised because of what they see their children doing. I know my brother does this very, very well. I would hope that I would do it as well. But see, honor is heavy. Honor is, is, is incredibly heavy. Look what the Bible has to say in the Old Testament about this. It says if a, in Deuteronomy, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. The, the gate of the city was kind of the place of meeting. It's where the elders hung up and drank their coffee and all that kind of stuff. It's just, just the place of meeting. Today would be the local coffee shop, maybe over yesteryear, or today maybe the, the driving range. I don't know where the elders hang out today, but that's kind of where they gathered. So you would take your son there. 
And they shall say to the elders of his city, this is our son, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. This was serious. God was giving them this command of honor your father and your mother, not just because he wanted to hear himself say something else, but he meant it. And he put such, he put a, a serious burden on the children. We're saying, you will do this. I didn't ask you to agree with them. I didn't ask you to like what they, what they do. I didn't ask you if, if you cared for your parents at all. I have commanded you to honor them. And the, the honor of, of the fact that, that as God shows us, because the parents really are symbolic of our Heavenly Father to us. It gives us a tangible, earthly thing to hold on to, to say, well, how do I relate to my Heavenly Father? Hopefully the same way you relate to your parents. Now, I understand in a fallen world, not all parents, are, are so, even I sometimes, act very ungodly. But as, as we strive to honor the Lord and grow in the Lord, then hopefully what I'm demonstrating to my kids is something they can say later on whenever they begin to, to move out of the house and, and their relationship with the Lord becomes even more significant with, with Father, that they begin to relate to God as they somewhat related to me as Father. Again, in a fallen world, unfortunately, not all, not all people have fathers. Not all fathers are godly. And so we have to look beyond that to our Heavenly Father. But that doesn't diminish the fact that God had put the family in place so that we could relate, we learn to relate to Him. And so as parents, the burden is on us to do that. As children, the serious matter is learn to honor your father and your mother. Because in the way that you honor them, so by it you honor the Lord. John Calvin goes on to say, he was one of the reformers back in the uh, 1500s. He says, nature itself ought in a way to teach us this. Those who abusively or stubbornly violate parental authority are monsters, not men. So, again, we, we have to, to take our situation as parents seriously. Children need to take their role as children in honoring their parents seriously. And both are important. Take this just one step further, especially for those, I had the, the blessing of growing up in a home where my parents were very godly people, and still are. And it breaks my heart to see kids grow up in a house where that's not the case, where the father is absent, or both parents are not seeking the Lord like they should. Let me just kind of give this challenge to those kids, even if those kids are now adults. Matthew 5, 46, Jesus tells us, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? In Matthew 5, 44, he, Jesus instructs love to those who are against you to pray for them. So if you have a parent who does not know the Lord as their Lord and Savior, don't spend your life arguing and bringing them grief. Honor them. Pray for them. And as the Spirit comes to you, let the Spirit provide the opportunity for you to show them Christ. But sometimes you probably need to show them Christ for a long time and with obedience, with just love and respect before they begin to realize, you know, there's something to this. Again, Take that as just kind of what it's worth from Matthew 5, 46, because that has not been my experience personally. So we, we've got to learn to honor unconditionally. So we don't speak evil of our parents. We don't defame them. We honor them in obedience unless they've asked us to do something that's against Scripture. We honor their authority unless that authority is abused, and by honoring them, we would be dishonoring God. But we can still be respectful to them, even if we biblically go against them. So how do we practice honor? One of the commentaries I have been reading through the study of the Ten Commandments is, was written by a, a man by the name of Kevin DeYoung. 
And he points out four ways that I've already kind of somewhat mentioned, but that I thought were just in great practical ways of honoring the Lord. So I wanted to, to share these with you. So first of all, how do we practice honor? By saying, yes, mom, or yes, dad. Or when they ask me to do something, it's not, well, I didn't do it, or it wasn't my fault that that happened. It's, yes, mom, I'll clean it up. Yes, mom, I'll go do that. Yes, dad. And, and you immediately, in obedience, you carry it out. As in an older sense with my parents today, they don't, they realize that I am my own person, and so our relationship's a little bit different. It's not the micromanaging thing, but on occasion they will say, David, have you thought about such and such? Yes, dad. That's, that's a good thought. Thank you for sharing that with me. Or, yes, mom, I'll, I'll do something about that. Um, and so it's still the honor and respect to them. Secondly, say thank you, mom. Thank you, dad. When's the last time you wrote a note of thanks to your parents? When's the last time you called them up if, if you don't live with them anymore? And just, mom, just call them to say thank you. I know it's not Mother's Day. It may be... You know, it's the 6th of July. I'm just, I'm just calling to say thank you. Thank you for all those nights you were awake when I didn't feel well. Thank you for all those days whenever you labored endlessly. You know, I realized whenever, especially when we were in Mexico City going to school, we would catch the bus about 6.30 in the morning to make it to school on time by 7.30, 7.45 because of Mexico City traffic. And it dawned on me some years later that... Uh, Mom was always up 4, 4.30 in the morning in order to prepare everything needed to prepare for us to be able to sit down as a family and have breakfast at 6 o'clock. Mom was always there. Our clothes were always washed. Our stuff was always tended to. And even though that was years ago, just calling up today and saying, Mom, just calling to say thank you. When's the last time we did that? Uh, if your parents are still with you, just last, just spontaneously, just walk in and say, hey, Dad, thanks. For no other reason, but just thanks. Thanks for always being there. Saying I'm sorry. I'm sorry is probably one of the hardest things for many of us to do. It's putting ourselves in, a, in, in humility saying, Mom, Dad, uh, I'm sorry. Not just because you caught me doing something, but because you really mean it. Uh, I'm sorry and, and this really kind of goes back to the honor-shame worldview because in innocent guilty, sometimes sorry, we, we don't really understand this. We, we're sorry because we are guilty. We're sorry because we, I am guilty. I'm sorry because I got caught. I don't realize the dishonor and the shame that I have brought my parents for what I have done. Even if it's something little as not cleaning up my room or or mistreating my brother or whatever it is, it's, we, we come, I'm sorry, but if we begin to realize, I'm sorry, mom, I'm sorry, dad, I just shamed you. I just shamed your name. I shamed who you are trying to bring me up as. I have brought shame on you. And because of that, shame on me. And even more so than, obviously, the shame that we have brought to our father's name if I call myself a Christian. But mom, dad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't listen. I'm sorry that I have dishonored and, and broken our relationship. There's a whole lot of healing that happens when one will practice just a little bit of humility and just say, I'm sorry. Say hello. Again, just pick up the phone. My, uh, as I left home from Mexico City to go to, uh, to Texas, came to uh, Hardin-Simmons for a year before going on Texas Tech for the engineering degree. I, but I moved um, just about 1,600 miles from home. And so going home on the weekends was not an option. It was back in the day where it was really expensive to call home, but international calling rates were very much in, in play. And so... Um, I didn't call a whole lot. I was one who really didn't practice writing a whole lot. My mom began to realize pretty quickly she was on a need-to-know basis. And if um, it wasn't that I was hiding anything, it's just that I never wrote. I never wrote. I never called. Uh, fortunately, she would call me on occasion. But today, it's a whole lot easier through FaceTime and through email and through text messaging and stuff. But even if you text, pick up the phone and just say, hi, mom. What's up? Nothing's up. Just call them to say hello. 
Just calling to let you know that I'm still alive and kicking. Things are going well. Just, hi. If your parents are right now, Tori is in Columbus, having to deal with some pretty significant decisions regarding her father, you know, we get parents in those aging situations, and sometimes it is necessary to place them in assisted living places. And it's nice for our parents to see us show up on occasion. Hi. Even if that's, you know, if that's not it, sometimes even if my parents are in Abilene, it takes a whole day to get there, we, you know, it's nice for us to show up over there on occasion. Just, hi, Mom. I'm here on important occasions, important dates, times when it might be significant to them. Those of you who have parents who are single now because maybe your father or your mother has, has gone to be with the Lord, even probably more important to call up and say, Dad, Mom, just thinking about you. Hi. Honor them. Don't neglect them. And then, of course, all this gets reciprocated to our Father. Just in the midst of the day, in the midst of our busyness, in the midst of what we're doing, just stopping and saying, hey, God, I know you've been there the whole day, but my mind has been in a thousand places. Just, I'm just stopping real quick to say, hi. Or, sorry, Lord, I really messed that up. And I brought shame on you. I brought shame on myself. I brought shame on Christ. I'm sorry. But thank you, God. And just, just stop and say, thank you, Lord. Because we have a God who has chosen to relate to us as our Heavenly Father. If you never had a father growing up, know, uh, I know that it's probably going to be hard to understand what a father is. But note that he wants to spend as much time as you will give him helping you to realize what that is. That he is your heavenly father. That he wants to have that relationship with you. That you can come to him at any moment through Jesus Christ and just say, God, I just need to sit in your lap for a second and, and cry. Or I just need to sit here. And, or God, listen, I learned this really funny joke today. At least I thought it was funny. Share it with him. He already knows it, but you can share it with him. Our Father wants that relationship. So as we've learned to honor the Lord and he alone, that there is no other, realizing that his name is all who he represents and so demands as much honor as we do, we find time in our lives to totally separate so that the Word of God can do a work in our life, bringing us closer to the Lord, that all these first four commandments have brought us to the point of number five of honoring our father and mother that is just an earthly representation of the relationship, ideal relationship, biblical relationship that God wants to have with us as well. And so as you honor them, you are honoring the Lord and you're learning to honor the Lord for eternity. So this week, think about some ways. What could I do to show honor to my parents if they're still alive? And if they're not, let me ask you this. Who are those people in your life that have made a difference in your life, that at some point in time have mentored you in your life? See, all through my life, I've had my earthly parents, and, and they are very much also my spiritual parents as well. But I've also had people who have mentored me along the way, older people, elders in my life that I have looked to because of their experience, because of their wisdom, and have allowed them to speak truth into my life. If your earthly parents are no longer with you, maybe some of those are. Call them up and just say hello. Thank you for investing in my life. And then in return, who can you be parenting? Who can you be spiritually parenting, spiritually pouring your life into um, to help them to learn to honor the Lord? So in honor our father and mother, it's never too late to do that because they gave you their name. And so until the day that you die, you will do that. But then it's also never too late to become a spiritual parent and to entrust to others what you have been entrusted with. So this week, I pray that the Lord would give us an added blessing in creativity, the willingness, and the courage to honor our parents. Father, I praise you because from day one, 
you instituted this thing called family. It wasn't by accident, it wasn't a mistake, it was your plan all along. And Lord, I pray that as we go about life that we would learn to honor. Honor those around us, but more significantly as we look at today's focus, honoring our parents, honoring mom and dad and, and showing them the respect, not just because it's their position, not because, Lord, you told us to, but because it's the godly, wise thing to do. Lord, may we be blessed in being able to have spiritual children that we might also be able to honor and to mentor, to help them to learn to honor you as well. So, Father, throughout this week, may your Spirit show us those places that are probably not so honoring and help us to remove those and maybe pick up some new habits of honoring. Thank you, Lord, for continuing to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen.